All right, news on your screen. The cabinet has cleared the uh, ordinance on food bill. That's the latest uh, news coming in right now. We'll try and get Abhijit uh, with us in a few moments uh, to give us a sense of what this will imply and really why it's significant as well. But as of now, there's the news coming in from cabinet. Uh, the food uh, ordinance bill has been cleared. Just to give you some amount of a recap on really what this entails as well, uh, just to run you through what we were anticipating uh, today uh, and why this is important. Now, the bill really aims to give rights to about 67% of the population, uh, you know, to get about 5 kilos of food grains per individual per month at a fixed price of 1 to 3 rupees a kilo through ration shops. So that's what the bill aimed to do. Of course, this has a lot of uh, you know, implications. On one hand, of course, it, it is once again a populist measure by the government. On the other hand, again, this could be largely subsidized. So we, we will just dissect this a little further and understand what kind of an impact it will have at this point, uh, whether it's politically or also whether it's uh, on, the, on the government's um, finances but in essentially that's really what uh, the bill is and uh, it, this will go further than what we already have from the public distribution system it will provide food grains cheap and uh, also it'll you know look at uh, look at providing it at individual basis as well and um, it's undergone several changes. It was first tabled back in December 2011. And uh, so finally getting cleared, uh, you know, it will also provide legal entitlement for subsidized grains to a host of sectors of the population. Um, that, that's what was, of course, uh, uh, suggested. We'll just speak to Abhijit on what exactly has been cleared. But a host of uh, sections of the population, like pregnant women, children, uh, the poorest among poor, for example, who would get it at that price of one rupee. Uh, so those were the, some of the uh, proposals uh, that, was, uh, that, were, uh, that were suggested. But of course, look at the cost of the bill. It would require an annual food subsidy of 131,000 crores, which includes about 8,000 crores for incidental expenditure. You'd need to set up a food commission on a national level, grievance redressal mechanisms, and so forth. And the government had put some of this aside in the 2013-2014 union budget, um, in fact, uh, but, uh, you know, so we have to wait and see uh, whether or not now uh, the amount of expenditure that's required exceeds what was budgeted for as well. Abhijit, the food ordinance bill being passed through, has it been passed through in its uh, you know, suggested form? Have there been any changes? And just take us through the significance of this as well. Well, uh, what's happened is uh, this, this, of course, is, uh, uh, was a cabinet briefing to a cabinet meeting, really, to discuss, first of all, whether the government should go in through the ordinance route or whether they should actually convene a special session of parliament. Remember, there was a lot of back and forth as far as uh, uh, you know, the route to be taken was concerned. Uh, this particular meeting was not really to decide on the contours of the food security bill. That's pretty much already decided. Uh, it, the, the food security bill, the design really, was that 67% of the population would be covered, and it would essentially give uh, subsidized grain, that's rice and wheat and coarse cereals, uh, to about 67% of the population. The big question really was uh, two things actually. One, one would, it, would it subsume the current uh, public distribution system? Secondly, uh, what would be the financial outgo? Now, as far as the financial outgo is concerned, in this fiscal in FY14, there would be a uh, limited uh, outgo uh, for the simple reason that the implementation of this, by the time this actually gets implemented, and the states also have to be on board to implement this, uh, the net impact uh, would, would actually be slightly limited. But the figures are varied. One estimate is that we still would have probably have to shell out, the government would still have to shell out about 20 to 25,000 crores additional on account of the food subsidy bill. Now remember, in the budget, in the current budget, there is, for the food, for, for the food bill per se, you've got about 90,000 crores, which is the budgeted figure. Out of that, 10,000 has been allocated for the food security bill. Now, if this, the ordinance now gets promulgated, which it will be, uh, the estimates from the finance ministry suggest that we are just talking about 10,000 crores additional. Now, that is a, a possibly one aspect which has to be debated. As far as the design is concerned, there are some issues which really uh, are still bothersome, and one is not sure whether the states are on board on that. Because, for example, at the state level, there has to be, uh, uh, you know, what do you do with the PDS mechanism? Uh, one gets the feeling, or one gets the sense that the PDS mechanism does stay, and this, the food security uh, arrangement will be over and above 
the, the existing PDS uh, system. And the other important point really is that, uh, you know, what happens uh, to the, the offtake, for example. Now, as of now, what happens is that, uh, you know, the government actually bears subsidy for FCI's offtake. As of now, as far as the buffer requirements are concerned for both wheat and rice, they're much in excess. Now, in that event, the bigger question mark is what happens to exports, because the moment the, the ordinance is promulgated, uh, it, of course, has to be ratified within six months by both houses of parliament, and assuming that it would be, and I'm not getting into the politics of it, the question then would be that will uh, the government actually have uh, enough and more to go for food security uh, for, for this fiscal, one gets the sense that at least as far as this fiscal is concerned, uh, there is. The, the other question, of course, is the pricing of it, which we will, of course, uh, come to it later. But let's, let's go across to Mr. Madan Sabnovitz, um, Economist with Care Ratings. So Mr. Sabnovitz, thanks very much for joining us. The uh, ordinance on food security is, uh, has been cleared. First of all, I know you don't have a political hat, but I have to ask you this. Are you surprised by the timing of this ordinance? Because, you know, the parliament session, or at least the monsoon session, is pretty close, and one would have expected the government to actually just go through the legislative route in the first place. No, I think the way of uh, they have decided to go through the ordinance route, so obviously there are certain uh, political reasons for it. But I think when we are looking at the food security bill, let's not really talk about the politics of it. Because I firmly believe that we do require a food security bill. It's the paramount responsibility of the government to address the concerns of the poor people. And therefore, when we're talking of a food security bill, which according to numbers which you have been talking of, of meaning an excess of maybe another 25, 30,000 crores than what the food security, than what the subsidy which has been provided for, to my mind, it's a fairly reasonable uh, n number. Because if you go to the World Bank estimates of what they define as poverty, when they use the $2 criteria, we would be talking of around 700 million people who fall under the poverty line defined by the $2 per day criteria. So I think that in case we're talking of a food security bill, which is talking of covering around 800 million, what you had mentioned, it's probably a little higher than what we are talk what the World Bank would be talking of. But I think it's a necessity, and I think this is something which we should not really be grudging the poor people. What we should actually be looking at is, are we going to target the right set of people, and whether we're going to build the kind of uh, buffers, both in terms of the physical availability of food grains, as well as the uh, fiscal concerns which are there. I think that's where the focus of attention should be on. So, Madan, what is the kind of pressure this would put on the fiscal situation? See, it would actually depend upon uh, what would be the additional uh, uh, pressure on uh, in terms of the food subsidy. So, let's try and put it this way. See, today if we're looking at the PDS system, which provides uh, 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 rice and wheat on the basis of your ration card, there are around 58 million tons which is being uh, dispersed under the PDS. Now, based on these informal estimates, when people are talking of food security bill, they're saying it could be something like 63 to 65 million tons. So, the problem really is not is in terms of the physical availability of the commodity because we have surplus stock which are lying with the Food Corporation of India which could always be used for uh, addressing this issue. But the problem on the food uh, subsidy burden is that presently the issue price of rice and wheat is in the region of say around 6 to 9 rupees depending upon uh, uh, which quality we are talking of. Now this particular rice and wheat is going to come at 1 rupee. So I think that's where the basic uh, problem for the government is going to be that you may be providing this 1 rupee benefit to people who may actually who are currently paying 6 to 7 rupees. So I think that's something which I think the government should try and address. Otherwise, the food subsidy bill will definitely be, be exceeded in the, in the coming years. Probably for the first year, we may not have this problem. But once it becomes all uh, encompassing across the, the entire population, even in case we cover 75% of this 800 million people we're talking of, there would be a additional pressure on account of the pricing uh, differential. Well, uh, uh, at this point, let's, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Abhijit Sen, uh, Member of Planning Commission. Uh, Dr. Sen, uh, first up, uh, you know, the, uh, the, food, the ordinance on food security has uh, been cleared. Are you a little surprised? Uh, were you expecting the government to go through the legislative route in the first place? I certainly would have preferred it, but I suppose there are other considerations which Cabinet must have concerned, uh, considered. I think certainly the legislative route will have to be done. I mean, all, all that the ordinance allows you to do is to wait for six weeks or so. Uh, so I don't know. There must be other considerations. 
Right. Uh, the, the obvious question to ask Dr. Sen is what, what it does uh, to the, the fiscal uh, uh, mathematics of the government. May not be this fiscal because there could be a limited impact, but going forward, there are procurement issues, there are subsidization issues, and there are carrying costs. Uh, in terms of the implementation, the financial viability of such a bill, which has been open to a wider debate, what are your views on that? Well, see, I don't think the procurement issue is much of an issue because the total grain requirement is actually less than what we've been procuring on an average in the last three years. Uh, so procurement isn't an issue. As far as the financial issues are concerned, in the short run, it's not going to, I think, cost anything as much as a lot of people are scared about. The real cost would be in terms of, uh, in terms of a slightly, I mean, in terms of the price differential between the current BPL and the new prices. That's the main the cost difference. Uh, and uh, to the extent that actually more grain moves through the system, in the short run, again, that would be a saving because of the carrying costs. You're actually going to be able to reduce stocks. In the much longer run, it would all depend upon uh, what the CACP does. If the CACP finally which sets out a subsidy bill, because they set the MSP, and that's, that's really what uh, it would all depend upon. Right, uh, Mr. Sen, thanks for joining us. Um, Madan, how likely do you think states are at this point to uh, follow through with this? No, I think some of the states which already have a very good record when it comes to public distribution system, like you know, some of the states are like Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, which have really done well, would be in a better position to implement it. Because we should also remember one thing that presently, given the kind of setup we have under the public distribution system, we are able to cover a certain amount of population. And there's, of course, a certain other segment, the, the very poor who are not being covered by the PDS because we don't have the infrastructure for it. So now when you're talking of the food security bill, we're talking of this 800 million people. This is the ideal of, let's say, the outer limit of, of uh, families which could be covered. Yeah? Now, the government will probably have to build a certain kind of an infrastructure to ensure that we're able to deliver this, which will also mean taking the states into consideration, both the state machinery as well as the central machinery, in order to create this infrastructure. So I think this will probably give us some kind of a breathing space between the time that we are making the announcement and the time when we really have to implement the scheme to the extent that we're covering the entire population which we're talking of. Well, uh, Madhin, uh, you know, in terms of the pricing now, uh, the, the CACP obviously will look at that aspect carefully. Now, the MSP for cereals like wheat and rice, do you see that uh, being incentivized to, to the extent that it does skew cropping patterns or production patterns here on? Because at the same time, your dietary preferences are shifting to, let's say, non-cereals, more non-cereals, more proteins. So to that extent, do you see MSPs and pricing... Uh, to incentivize, uh, uh, you know, rice and wheat actually going against economic logic from here on. You know, if you look at the way in which the MSPs have been tackled with for the current season, I think the increase which they've announced of around 5% is much lower than what has been done in the past. And I think earlier the kind of problem which we had was really that any kind of shortfall in wheat or rice was considered to be a national calamity. So if you go back, say, four or five years when we had a wheat crisis where we had to import wheat finally from Canada, Australia, it became a major political issue because we were actually importing wheat, something which was said that instead of being self-sufficient in wheat, we had reached a situation where we had to import wheat. So that was the reason why the MSPs started being increased, I would say, in a rather indiscriminate manner. Though, of course, the CACP always had a, had a justification for saying that there is a fixed formula on the basis of which these prices are fixed. Now, I think with high inflation and everybody turning uh, the, the, the cause of high food inflation to, to the MSPs, the CACP has been more conservative this time at talking of just 5% uh, increase. Now, going ahead, I should tend to think that uh, the CACP will take into account what kind of stocks uh, lie with the FCI, what kind of production numbers we're looking at, and whether what kind of migration we have seen from cultivation of rice and wheat to the other crops. Now, as of now, we have seen that farmers are preferring to grow rice and wheat because you get an assured price, you have uh, an assured price, and you have an assured uh, 
purchase of uh, rice and wheat, which you don't have for the other crops. So I think this kind of a balance is what the CACP will have to look after. And unfortunately, I feel that once we are committed to supplying rice and wheat under the food security, we will continue to focus on rice and wheat, which may not be very good in terms of uh, what it does for the soil and for the overall cropping pattern. Because rice and wheat are typically the crops which consume more moisture, more water, which has been affecting the water levels also in the, in, in the, in the northern states. So that's one major concern which I have based on the, on the, on the pricing pattern as well as the, uh, the food security bill which is being introduced. Madan, do you see this replacing the public distribution system? So it will have to be a part of the public distribution system because when I'm saying that I'm going to provide these food grains at one rupee per kilo, I need to distribute it from certain points. And these are going to be the PDS shops which we have. So it won't be a case of substituting. It will be a case of additional responsibility for the public distribution system to ensure that we're able to uh, carry out what this particular bill talks of. So we need to have a very robust system. Because today, everybody is very critical of the PDS system in terms of the kind of leakages which take place. Now, while I think uh, at some point of time in, in the parliament, one of the ministers had actually said that the leakages have come down from something like 40 to 50 percent to 20 percent. Now, we don't know what the truth is, but definitely there are certain kind of leakages which have to be plugged. And the starting point will be in terms of identification of the poor. So, so Madan, uh you know, are you therefore suggesting, and this is something that I was anyway going to put to you, why not instead of going through a leaking PDS system, why not go the whole hog and get into an income transfer mode as far as the food security is concerned, instead of ferreting around, carrying around food stocks all over the country, which is basically uneconomical and archaic, uh, doesn't it make more sense to actually just give them the market determined price on an income transfer basis and get them to, uh, get them to buy it at market determined prices isn't that uh, more viable and more doable it definitely appears to be a very efficient system something which could be used but we need to know that the prices of rice and wheat they vary substantially across the country so there'll be a whole question of saying that what is the price of rice for example in the north and the price in the south there's a big variation and the variation could be as much as around 10 rupees per kilo so how do i fix such a price and if, if i if i'm with today what happens under the pds there's a fixed price at which everybody is procure, is purchasing the food grains and and the, and the purchase cost is being borne by the government but the moment i say that i'm going to give you a cash now if the price of say for, uh, rice costs say 15 rupees in, in in the south and say 25 rupees in the north now there will be a case of political lobbying which will automatically come up where the states are also going to lobby for saying that you will have to keep adjusting my price uh, 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 on the basis of whatever these benchmarks are. Second issue will be in terms of inflation. The moment I get into a cash transfer and I have an inflation, the price of these crops are going up every year, then automatically I'll have to keep inflating these numbers. So it becomes a huge logistical problem as far as the government is concerned. So my suggestion is that when I have a very, when I have an elaborate infrastructure for uh, implementing the PDS, which could be extended for the food security, let's try and make it more robust rather than abandon this, in, uh, this entire system. Because today we should remember we have around 5 lakh uh, public uh, p uh, uh, fair price shops. What happens to these shops? Today when we're talking of FDI in retail, our major thing is how are the retailers going to be affected? Similarly, the question is, I'm going to talk in terms of 5 lakh uh, shopkeepers, Mr. maybe Sandra with one or two attendants. I'm talking of 15 lakh people remaining unemployed on account well, of I, demolishing of this system. I take your so point, I Mr. Think, yeah. Sorry, uh, just sorry to interrupt you. We're just running out of time, but thanks very much for joining us, Mr. Sabnavis, and sharing us uh, that insight. We also joined right now by uh, senior editor of the Hindustan Times, uh, Mr. Vinod Sharma. Mr. Sharma, thanks very much for joining us on the show. If I can begin by asking you, what was the hurry of the ordinance route? I mean, you've got a uh, parliament session coming up, what, in a month's time now, not even a month's time now. Shouldn't they have taken the legislative route? We've already got the Samajwadi Party saying that they will oppose this because uh, this, they believe, is anti farmer well, of course, the reasons were political because ostensibly there was no consensus uh, on this bill, both in terms of its provisions and also whether this will find acceptance in the parliament if it is brought by their bill in parliament. Uh, of course, uh, there were political parties that wanted more provisions, like the left, and there were other political parties which said that these, uh, this bill will go against the interest of farmers, namely the Samajwadi Party. But I think that uh, the Congress wants to pick up some good talking points before the coming elections to the state assemblies, five state assemblies, 
Uh, and that's the reason that they have come up with this bill. Of course, a uh, better way would have been to uh, have it discussed in Parliament and have it passed by Parliament. But that option still remains because any ordinance for it to become an act, it will have to be debated and passed in Parliament. So that, in nutshell, is the political impulse behind it. So sure, we'll, we'll come back to the political uh, aspect of it, Mr. Sharma, but if I can just go to uh, Mr. N.C. Saxena, uh, who is a former member of the uh, NAC. Mr. Saxena, you know, one of the criticism of, the, uh, of this particular bill is, A, of course, uh, A, it will put fiscal pressure on the government to fund this kind of an arrangement, maybe not in this fiscal, next fiscal, and the other is the basic design. Now, you've got a leaking PDS system in this country. Uh, why should the government ensure that food stocks are actually physically carried around the country for ultimate delivery through the fair price shops and not actually go to the income transfer route. Why has that design not been factored in? Yeah, income transfer route is not practical solution because once you buy 60 million tons of food grain from the farmers, you can't throw it in the Arabian Sea. Uh, PDS is an outlet for uh, the minimum support price uh, that uh, that uh, farmers we buy from the farmers. The other point is that PDS certainly is not working well in UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, uh, and some other states. But it's, there has been a great deal of improvement in Odisha, Rajasthan, Himachal Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, uh, and Madhya Pradesh, apart from the southern states. So to say that PDS is a leaky uh, subsidy, etc., is not correct. Lastly, I would say that. Government should uh, use the direct benefit uh, transfer route, which means that the, the consumer will still go to the shopkeeper with just two rupees in hand and his card, but the shopkeeper will get uh, food grain from the FCI at 20 rupees, and 18 rupees will get transferred. When this happens, the shopkeeper will not be able to sell it in the open market. The shopkeeper will run after the consumer that please come and collect uh, your uh, uh, grain, your entitlement, and this will certainly improve the relationship between the shopkeeper and the poor people. So therefore, direct benefit transfer has a great deal of potential, but it requires, uh, you know, Aadhaar, it requires uh, financial inclusion, which will take time. So there is a great deal of uh, potential for improvement. And the last thing I would say is that uh, this, audience, this uh, announcement for food security was made by the President of India in 2009. Four years have passed. Now, enough discussion has taken place. We have seen how Parliament functions. So therefore, I don't have in much faith in the Parliament debating this, uh, having a meaningful debate. People will take positions based either on their political ideologies or they are going to fight, uh, just shout uh, slogans as they have been doing in the past. So therefore, ordinance is a very good route. Unfortunately, the, the administrative arrangement for uh, uh, for uh, identifying the poor people, for deciding interstate uh, locations, that has not been done. So therefore, now we should concentrate on identifying who are the real beneficiaries. This may take about five to six months. So for the next five to six months, one doesn't know in what manner people are going to benefit from this uh, uh, ordinance. Uh, fair enough, uh, Mr. Saxena. But in terms of the pressure it's going to put on the government's finances and given the current state of the fiscal deficit, do you think the timing uh, for this, even though it's been a long time coming, uh, is, is going to be a little difficult for the government on that front? Yeah, in fact, if you, uh, this, this fiscal, of course, the impact would be very limited because, uh, as I said, for the next six months, actual distribution is going to be very, very, very minimal. Uh, next fiscal, there could be some impact. But why should our tax GDP rate should be so low as 15 percent? Uh, other developing countries are in the range of 25 to 35 percent. It is the tax collection which needs to improve, and unnecessary non-merit subsidies uh, need to be reduced on petrol, on diesel, on uh, fertilizers. If we reduce those subsidies, surely we can find enough money uh, for the hungry people. So therefore, I am all in favor of um, the subsidies. And after two, three years, we can increase the uh, price. This price of two rupees and three rupees was fixed in 2000. It may not, come, uh, it may not continue. People are interested in getting a certain supply. Uh, if they get 35 kg, uh, even at five rupees, they would be very happy. 
Unfortunately, so far the experience is that people in Bihar uh, get only 2% of their requirement from the PTS. In UP, it's only 6%. So it is this uh, which needs to improve. Prices are unimportant. Uh, Mr. Mr. Deke Joshi joins us uh, from uh, Crystal. He's a senior economist. Uh, in fact, he's the chief economist with uh, Crystal. Crystal, Mr. Joshi, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, one of the first questions that I really want to pose to you is what does this do to cropping patterns? Because from here on, there's going to be an incentive for uh, cereals, for your wheat, for rice, because obviously you, the physical availability is going to be an issue because though right now you've got bountiful stocks that may or may not always last. So. In terms of pricing patterns, in terms of crop patterns, do you see a distortion coming uh, in the years ahead? Well, I think we already have a distortion in terms of that we are heavily uh, biased towards rice and wheat. And I think that, that's going to continue. I think also if the only way to deal with that is to, to focus on raising productivity. I mean, our productivity levels are very low. If you compare it to China, they're quite low. So there's a lot of scope for raising uh, the the yields of crops. I think that's the only way out going ahead because you can't expand the the uh, the land area and farms are anyway getting uh, fragmented. So I think focus has to be on providing uh, irrigation uh, via conserving water. It has to be on improving the seeds. It, it has to be on uh, better extension services. I think that's the only way you can deal with this uh, situation. It's not an insurmountable problem, but I think it will require uh, rekindling of agriculture. What does this do, uh, Dr. Joshi, what does this do to our export policy, especially of uh, food grains? Because as of now, remember, the government was toying with the idea of allowing back uh, wheat exports and stuff. But from here on, because there would be pressure on to ensure physical availability of stocks, uh, to that extent, do you see uh, you know, further clamp down as far as exports are concerned, at least on the grains on the cereal side? Well, I think as, uh, right now, I think we have surplus. I think the CACP has already estimated that you could uh, uh, you could export worth $10 billion of uh, wheat, uh, even after taking care of food security and buffer stock norms. So we ha already have access at this juncture. So it's not going to pose a problem immediately. And anyway, I think the bill will be take time before actually people are identified and subsidies are doled out. So there is some, that's some time away. But going ahead, yeah, I think... Uh, uh, it will, I think, we'll have to ensure enough stocks of, of food grains within the economy. What are some of the other p problems in implementation of this that you see, Dr. Joshi? Well, I think the, uh, the biggest challenge is to who is going to get it. I mean, how do you identify the poor? Uh, the, uh, the, that, that's going to be a tough challenge uh, going ahead, and I think states are supposed to do that. So we'll have to see how uh, the, the true beneficiaries are identified. And then I think the second would be, I think there's enough, there's a lot of talk of using the Aadhaar platform or direct benefit transfer. So how, what are the modalities? I think there's no clarity on that. And actually, even if you eventually uh, plan to use Aadhaar uh, platform, I think you have to speed up the, 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 uh, uh, the process in the, in the backward areas. I mean, the people who need the most are, uh, are not, not being covered at that fast rate. I mean, as far as Aadhaar is concerned. So I think, uh, uh, two challenges. One, I think, how do you use leverage on technology which you are already invested enough to to make this uh, a success? And second, I think, is, is, is which has always been a perpetual problem in India, is how do you ensure that uh, the, the, the benefits reach the poor, which is linked to identification of, uh, proper identification of poor. Dr. Joshi, do you believe that, uh, and are some proponents uh, of the theory, that if you actually ultimately use income transfer method uh, rather than ferreting stocks all around the country physically through fair price shops, do you think that the income transfer method actually is more inflationary, that at the end of the day, it actually will fuel more food price inflation? I mean, see, both in both the ways, you are creating more demand. I mean, so I, I mean, we have not looked at the inflationary aspect of, uh, of, of, of direct uh, uh, cash transfer or income transfer. But my presumption is that both will exert pressure on food no matter how you do it. Dr. Joshi, what is the kind of impact of this you see on the macroeconomic environment right now? 
Well, I think uh, uh, from a macro perspective, it's definitely a charge on the government finances because if, as and when it gets implemented, I think you'll have to allocate more funds to food security bill. Uh, uh, for that, I think uh, if you want to keep public finances in order, I think you'll have to ensure that other subsidies are already being trimmed and they, are trimmed, uh, they get trimmed at a faster pace so that overall subsidy bill of the government doesn't alter. If that doesn't happen, then obviously I think the fiscal, uh, there is a uh, fiscal pressure clearly emerging from, uh, uh, from this bill. Dr. Joshi, given the fact, given the fact that, you know, your, uh, uh, your, both your oil subsidies as well as, uh, you know, your uh, other subsidies, actually fertilizer, are pretty much on the same levels, and now you've got this particular uh, subsidy now coming to hit the government. And if you look at the l last figures, the May figures released by the CGA, the fiscal deficit uh, has already touched about one third of the budgeted target for the entire year. Obviously, the fiscal situation from here on doesn't look good because your uh, plan expenditure is actually up 12%. Your revenues are still lagging. Disinvestment proceeds are still lagging. So the 4.8% figure does it look doable at this point in time? FI14, early days here, but I have to pose this question to you. Well, I think uh, government doesn't, will not be able to uh, meet the deficit target the way it did last year by cutting expenditure because I think this is uh, one, this is also a pre-election year. So, and uh, spending has already been cut enough in 2012-13. So I think uh, the, the only way to meet the, meet the fiscal targets is either push the divestment program very hard uh, or I think, uh, uh, or, or concentrate on revenue generation, which is an uphill task in a, in a year when the economy is not doing well. So I think we see the fiscal target being breached, and our estimate is around 5.1% of GDP, and not 4.8 for 2013-14. All right, uh, fair enough there. Dr. Joshi, uh, also going ahead uh, from here, are you expecting any kind of resistance to this at the state level? We have had some states that have already uh, put, uh, put into practice, you know, something along these lines, for example, Chhattisgarh and so forth, uh, but not really at such an individual level. Uh, well, I think uh, it, uh, implementation is always a challenge. I think you'll have to, uh, but eventually, I think if if, it, if the bill gets debated and passed in the parliament, I think there will be little opposition to this. That's what I what I believe. So I think these all these issues that you are mentioning, I think of implementation at the individual level. I think they will get sorted out. It will take time. I mean, uh, and if if it doesn't get sorted out, I think then it, it the bill only ends up as a fiscal burden. Right, Dr. Joshi, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Abhijit, it looks like, uh, as with everything else, it's, it's a good step, but with so many riders as to how it's implemented, uh, you know, really how, what the breakdown is on ground, how it's going to impact the, the poor, will it actually reach the people it's meant to reach, and, of course, the ensuing fiscal burden as well. Lots of questions that remain unanswered at this point. Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, first of all, there, there is a huge political question now on why the government has adopted the ordinance route because already we've got voices from the principal opposition party, from the Samajwadi party saying that, look, you know, uh, this, this bill is a landmark bill and really merits a proper debate in parliament. Of course, it has to be ratified in parliament within six months as per uh, the, the constitution. But even then, this is going to create uh, political uh, friction all over again. Be that as it may, even on the, the economics or the me mechanics of this bill, first of all, uh, there are issues about the way it will be implemented because, remember, the states have to be on board. Then there are issues about what it does cost to the exchequer. Fine, in this particular year, the impact would be limited because you're starting in the middle of the year, but from then on, from FY15 onwards, you know, the pressure on the fisc will obviously get immense. And, you know, it's not that, that it's not as if the government can cut down on the other subsidies overnight. The questions about the way it should be implemented, the PDS at the end of the day is still leaking. Is income tra transfer a better method? Will it be less inflationary, more inflationary? What does pricing of crops, how do you do pricing of crops? Uh, you know, how, how do you ensure that crop patterns are not uh, skewed? How do you ensure that your export policies are in sync with physical, domestic, physical availability? How do you identify beneficiaries? These are questions which really need answers and answers uh, soon enough if this particular bill, which is a landmark and a pet project of the UPA, has to be implemented on the ground. So as we go forward, hopefully, we shall get uh, more answers. But from a socio-economic point of view, you cannot argue with the uh, principle of the bill, food for all. 
and uh, we've got to wait and watch uh, how the UPA actually gives us all those answers, but uh, a step perhaps in the right direction, though the economics of it still up in the air. Welcome back to Big News at this hour. The Cabinet clearing the ordinance uh, on uh, the food bill. Let's have to go uh, back across to Abhijit at this point of time. Abhijit, uh, very significant as we have been discussing for a number of reasons. If we could just uh, recap, of course, uh, the highlights of the bill uh, as it stands. It still, of course, has to be validated by the Parliament. Yes, well, it uh, proposes to offer food security about 67% of the population, essentially give about uh, food security coverage uh, to uh, identified beneficiaries. Now, the Planning Commission will do the actual uh, identification. There's talk that the identification would actually happen on the Aadhaar platform linked to the EOID. But, of course, the beneficiaries will then also have to be in consultation uh, with uh, the particular states. Uh, we do also understand, uh, first of all, it, there would be about... 5 kgs of uh, grain per individual uh, as per this uh, particular bill which is going to be uh, then enacted into an act. Uh, the distribution mechanism would be the existing uh, public distribution system mechanism. That is not being subsumed. Uh, essentially, the FCI will have a big role to play in terms of offtake from uh, the government uh, on behalf of the government. And then they would, of course, uh, deliver it uh, to the states and the ultimate point of delivery to the uh, c consumer would be the fair price uh, or the public distribution shops. There is, of course, uh, uh, one aspect. Uh, there's, there's actually so many aspects to it. One, of course, if you look at it, is the uh, the fiscal aspect of it. And th there are varying degrees of concern about what it would uh, cost the fisc. Now, if you look at the budgeted numbers for this particular year, FY14, uh, the, the foods, food bill uh, is about 90,000 crores, out of which 10,000 crores has been earmarked for food security. Now we do understand that this middle of the year implementation would uh, ensure that your food security bill, uh, bill purely on account of the implementation of this particular act would be about 20 to 25,000 crores and this essentially means the, the government has to earmark another 15,000 crores because of this act. So that is as far as this particular fiscal but for the next fiscal obviously this would shoot up. The other question uh, which comes to everybody's mind is that how would you procure? As of now, if you look at your wheat uh, availability position, rice availability position, actually it's pretty bountiful, much beyond even buffer norms, to the extent that there is, there is talk about exporting some of this. But going forward, year after year, you have to ensure that you find enough stocks to allow to ensure food security, which will be mandated into a law. And for that, you, your pricing has to be such that you incentivize these crops. Uh, the criticism, of course, is that a you know the states also have to be on board for this, and there are many states who are not exactly ready, even in terms of physical distribution. The other uh, uh, talking point, or criticism is criticism is that in, instead of the income transfer route, you adopted to you know give this particular facility through the normal PDS system, and you don't do not have enough storage capacity in the country to do that. The third criticism is that well. At the end of the day, what you're doing is incentivizing uh, production, further production of rice and gains, grains, where anyway India is self-sufficient, but dietary patterns are shifting to protein-based diets, uh, and uh, you know the pricing patterns actually would skew production towards more cereal-based uh, production, so which is a, another criticism. But at the end of the day, one cannot argue with the broad philosophy of this in, in a country like ours, with no income nets, no social security nets. Perhaps this is a step in the right direction. Uh, of course, on a political platform, politically speaking, this is a pet project of Mrs. Sonia Gandhi, who piloted uh, this project and uh, almost uh, coerced, or shall I say persuaded the government to go with it because there were reservations even among the finance ministry and the PMO about what it would cost uh, to the exchequer. So at the end of the day, it's something that uh, tries to marry good politics with good economics, but as I said, the economics of it will only evolve as the government goes ahead and tries to implement this on the ground. All right, here are some uh, reactions. We've got to uh, post the news coming in this evening as well. Listen into these. The procurement issue is much of an issue because the total grain requirement is actually less than what we've been procuring on an average in the last three years. So procurement isn't an issue. As far as the financial issues are concerned, in the short run, 
it's not going to, I think, cost anything as much as a lot of people are scared about. The real cost would be in terms of in terms of a slightly, I mean, in terms of the price differential between the current BPL and the new prices. EDS is an outlet for the minimum support price uh, that uh, that uh, farmers we buy from the farmers. The other point is that PDS certainly is not working well in UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, and some other states. But it's, there has been a great deal of improvement in Odisha, Rajasthan, Himachal Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, uh, and Madhya Pradesh, apart from the southern states. So to say that PDS is a leaky uh, subsidy, etc., is not correct. Lastly, I would say that government should uh, use the direct benefit uh, transfer route. So I think that in case we're talking of a food security bill, which is talking of covering around 800 million, what you mentioned, it's probably a little higher than what we are talk what the World Bank would be talking of. But I think it's a necessity, and I think this is something which we should not really be grudging the poor people. What we should actually be looking at is: Are we going to target the right set of people, and whether we're going to build the kind of uh, buffers, both in terms of the physical availability of food grains as well as the uh, fiscal concerns which are there? I think that's where the focus of attention should be on. All right, that's where we leave it at this hour, but that's the big news for you. Uh, the cabinet uh, clearing the ordinance on food security.